Hello, everyone. Welcome to Green Nursing. So during our postpartum period, this is probably the most critical time for our mom. And um, this is when that transition period of really becoming a family happens. So there's lots of things that we as nurses are going to be um, looking out for. We call postpartum or purpurium, sometimes you see it mentioned that way, as the period of uh, the delivery after of the placenta all the way up into the six weeks um, following that time. So it's really an adjustment time for everyone in this woman's life um, that are getting used to this new family member. So there's physiological adjustment as well as psychological. So part of our role is to assess, assist, and educate. So we are assessing for risk factors, deviations from the normal. The key here is that we have to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. And early intervention is going to be um, the key into uh, promoting good outcomes. We're looking at promoting comfort for the mom, returning to that pre-labor state, things like ambulation, self-care, um, giving it back her her privacy, and then promoting bonding between her and her baby. And this is a process that takes uh, time for some people, especially depending on the type of delivery and any um, complications that happen during that delivery. And then we're looking, we're educating this mom on the signs and symptoms that are, are that need to be reported. So again, you have to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. Looking at things like self-care, feeding, um, all kinds of uh, effort goes into helping feed these new ones, is, whether it be breast or bottle, and we need to um, be giving good education and letting these moms know where they're going to be able to have support once they leave the hospital. Community resources are key information that needs to be given to these moms. So our typical assessments during that first immediate postpartum period is uh, usually every 15 minutes for the first two hours. Uh, in a lot of units, you've seen this kind of um, reduced to maybe the first hour or so, and then they're moving on to a postpartum floor. But those first couple of hours are really essential to make sure that we have a good assessment, have eyes on our mom and our baby. So the recommendation is that for the first two hours, we are watching them very closely. And then during the first 24 hours, depending on the, again, policy of the unit that you are on, it's going to be somewhere between every four to six hours. They recommend in that newborns go no longer no more than four hours so you might as well look at the mom when you're in the room looking at the newborn things that we are assessing for looking at those vital signs these are going to be key to tell for early intervention so there might be a slight elevation of that temperature during that first norm first 24 hours but it should not be over 100.4 uh, Fahrenheit. If we're looking at over 100.4 Fahrenheit, then we have to uh, consider that maybe there's an infection brewing. Pulse should be somewhere between 40 to 80 beats per minute. Respirations are going to be somewhere between 16 and 20. Blood pressure should be normal for the patient. So if she had high blood pressure before, we don't expect it to be immediately fixed. So if you see a drop of 30 or 40 points in someone that had high blood pressure, that could actually be bringing them down to the normal range, but that's not normal for them. And um, back up to the pulse for just a minute. This pulse is going to be key in looking for that early signs of postpartum hemorrhage and infection. So we're going to see uh, signs of that pulse rising if she has had if she's lost too much blood. Now these are typically healthy young women that are compensating. So if she has lost a lot of blood um, during the delivery, the first thing that's going to happen is her pulse is going to start to rise in an effort to compensate for that leak in the system. Um, same with infection. First thing you're going to see is that pulse is going to start rising just a bit. And her pain, we want to get her pain back into those um, smaller ranges. So a goal between zero and two is acceptable. And if we go outside of that, we need to be looking at um, different comfort measures that might help her get to that uh, pain goal between zero and two. 
This is an example of a fundal assessment. So again, you're going to use your lower hand to support the lower uterine segment. And usually I actually put it down a little bit further. And then you're using the upper hand to A, determine that it is firm and the um, location is midline and B, determine where it is in relationship to the umbilicus. So you're going to be doing lots of assessments when you're actually doing this fundal assessment. And uh, this is super important to know that that uterus is staying nice and firm. If this mom has a cesarean section incision, we're actually going to be putting our hand over that incision with a glove on, of course, and, and giving it some support while we're pressing from above to make sure that that uterus is staying firm. <clears throat> The fundal height um, is going to start to decline as the we get further out from the delivery. So day one, two, and three, we should see it somewhere around that umbilicus, depending on how big the baby was and um, how large the uterus got after, um, you know, with the baby on the inside. So if you have multiples, obviously you're going to expect this fundus is going to be higher, but we need to know what's normal for the mom in order to know if she's deviating from that from her normal. And then as the days progress, we're going to see this move back down. And by about the day five or six, it's going to start to dip back into that um, pelvis. And we may or may not be able to feel it anymore. We wouldn't be doing fundal exams at that point um, unless there was if she was presenting with some sort of problem because they've been home for a long time um, during that point. But again, we're measuring where that fundus is, fundus being the top of the uterus in relationship to the umbilicus, how many fingers above or below, and if it's in the midline and if it's firm. This is an example of what the uh, fluid, lochia, looks like after delivery. So it starts off as dark red, we call that rubra, and then it moves to more of a serosa, pinkish brown, and then it turns to a yellowish white. If at any point it goes from, uh, it backtracks, it goes maybe from alba back to rubra or serosa, we're concerned, something's going on. This is looking at, um, these large peripads that we're discussing. So light would be considered a one to four inch stain. Moderate would be at a four to six inch stain and heavy is saturating that pad in one hour. In the immediate postpartum period, we're going to be using quantitative blood loss. That's evidence-based practice um, to be able to treat those early, uh, to be able to treat hemorrhage early. And, but as, as we, educate mom on what to expect when she goes home, we need to be able to give her some um, criteria that she's going to recognize. So soaking a pad in an hour is heavy flow and needs to be reported to the physician. Also, if it goes, if it starts to backtrack and moves back um, in, in the stages, regresses, um, then we want to have her report that if she's passing a clot larger than an apricot or if she has a really foul smell. Those are all reasons that she would want to seek um, care. Our RETA assessment is a way of looking at our postpartum perineal assessment. We're looking for redness, edema, ecchymosis, which is bruising, uh, any discharge, and if the edges are approximated, are they staying together? We're always looking for things um, to see if the episiotomy is staying together, if the if a tear has been repaired to stay together, if there's additional tearing that maybe wasn't noted at delivery, hematoma formation, super important that we're watching for that. Most women will complain so much about the increasing pain that um, you won't be able to ignore a hematoma. And then hemorrhoids. These are all things that we can help this mom in um, supporting her with some pain relief for all of these different things. So after the baby is born, the uterus is going to contract back down. It's going to release all of that fluid and, and lochia that was um, there to help support that pregnancy. There will be after pains as that uterus contracts back down. The more babies a woman has had, the more she's going to feel those after pains. Her cervix is now going to appear um, with a jagged slit-like opening. Of course, most of the time we're not looking at the cervix anymore. We're certainly not putting our hands in, in the vagina to feel the cervix anymore. But if you were to look at it, it would definitely look like it has just um, 
had a baby that came through. Uh, the vagina is eventually going to have um, some thickening and the return of the rugae that kind of disappeared during the delivery. And as the body has expelled this fetus now, all the organs are going to go back into place, um, into the place that they were before the baby was born. We will pay special attention to the perineum, especially, like I said, if there's any tears or um, uh, lacerations or uh, cuts that need to be healed. Uh, our rest of our physical assessment, we're going to be looking at the breasts, um, and I'll spend more time talking about that in just a minute. I already talked about the uterus. We want to know how her bladder is emptying, because if that bladder is not emptying well, it will keep the uterus from from contracting down and firming up. So we want to know how well she's voiding. So we should be measuring at least for the first time after she voids to make sure that she is emptying that bladder. And um, some women that have had epidurals and, and or uh, spinals do have a little bit of an issue emptying that bladder. That's one of the last things that, that kind of comes back into their control. And occasionally we do have to do a straight cath to help them empty that bladder and then hopefully it's not numb anymore by the time it's time to empty it again. We're going to be watching for bowels, um, look, definitely looking for bowel sounds, distension, especially if she's had a cesarean section. Uh, again, I talked about doing that RETA assessment, looking at any swelling in those extremities and her emotional status. How is she handling um, the process now of recovery and bonding with this baby? The urinary system is actually is going to change as well. There could be perineal lacerations that could affect it. There could be swelling there. If she's had a Foley catheter, that could affect her urinary system. We're watching for hematomas. I already mentioned that there's that diminished sensation to the bladder. And so we want to pay attention to the urinary system very closely. GI system. If she has had a cesarean, we're going to see decreased bowel tone for several days. There will be decreased peristalsis. In fact, we don't want to put anything into her mouth until we hear good bowel sounds because we don't want to uh, cause another problem like an ileus. Constipation is very common it, after having a baby, whether it be from a vaginal birth or a cesarean. So we want to make sure that she is drinking lots of water, eating lots of bulk forming foods, so lots of fiber, fresh fruits and vegetables, that sort of thing, and uh, giving her some colase, which will help to, or docusate, um, which will help her to um, uh, have a stool that is not quite so formed. Many women are afraid of pushing the stool out, so we have to be um, very mindful of giving her good education about not getting constipated. Also, I will mention here that if she is using any narcotic pain relief, that we do have the issues that come along with constipation and narcotic pain use. So that education needs to be given to the mom and that it's imperative that she be taking some sort of stool softener to um, accompany that medication and to try to get off of it as soon as possible. The musculoskeletal system is also going to change. Remember, she had that lordosis forming as the pregnancy advanced, and then uh, um, those muscles start to shorten and tighten. And so many women will have um, continued backache after pregnancy for a while. And now, of course, they're carrying this baby on the outside. Um, abdominal muscle tone is diminished after birth. That's going to take time to reduce to return and then the joints return to their pre-pregnant state except for their feet. Usually women will recognize that they've had a um, maybe a size change, a size increase in their shoe size after pregnancy. Integumentary system, those um, uh, uh, stria gravidarum start to fade. They'll become kind of a silvery whitish um, color and eventually that mask of pregnancy will go back as those hormones uh, recede. We also will see some diaphoresis, which is very common in the first week postpartum. This is the mom's way of helping to uh, bring her, her blood volume back down to where it needs to be. If we have pumped a bunch of IV fluid into her during delivery, then now that IV fluid is now going to have to make its way out of the body. And sometimes you will see increased edema for the first couple of days after delivery. And the key is to drink lots of fluid, put their feet up, and um, hopefully it will pull that out of the tissue and she'll be able to urinate it out. 
The respiratory and endocrine system also have some changes. They're going to return to pre-pregnant values um, within one to three weeks after birth as far as the respiratory system goes. We, we definitely see that estrogen and progesterone levels drop quickly. Those placental hormones decline as soon as the placenta has come out of the body, which is the natural way. This is how things are supposed to work. As those placental hormones decline, we see our prolactin increase, and that is the prolactin is what is going to allow us to have the milk supply that we need in order to feed our babies. These are danger signs. Every woman leaving the hospital needs to know these danger signs. Every um, nurse taking care of a postpartum woman needs to make sure that a woman understands these danger signs and that these are to be followed up on immediately. So a fever of 100.4 or more, foul smelling lochia or an unexpected change, large blood clots, large blood clots or bleeding that saturates that pad in an hour, severe headaches or blurred vision, or any other visual changes like um, seeing spots, um, uh, feeling like you're going to pass out when you stand up. These are all reasons that need to be um, looked at immediately. If she has calf pain when she flexes her foot, swelling, redness, or discharge at the episiotomy, epidural, or abdominal sites, dysuria, meaning it's really painful to urinate, burning, or incomplete emptying of the bladder, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing without exertion, and depression or extreme mood swings. These are all reasons that she needs to seek attention immediately. This is a device called a Sarah Steady. Hopefully um, you'll get the opportunity to see these in your units. This is one of the tools that we use to make sure that they are able to safely ambulate after delivery. It's not uncommon for a mom to feel lightheaded and dizzy once she gets up to the bathroom. So this is why we say she must have help with from her nurse to get up to the bathroom. We always want to check her blood pressure first, have them sit on the side of the bed for a few minutes. Then they can stand up, do a couple of steps in place to make sure that her uh, legs are going to hold her, that her epidural is worn off if she's had one. And then we want to support them to the restroom. Once you're in the bathroom, we're going to show them how to do their peri care using that peri bottle, squirting front to back, not letting the tip touch them, giving them good education about patting themselves dry, changing their peri pad every time they get up to the restroom, and um, nothing in the vagina for six weeks. No tampon, no douching, no sex, no fingers, no vices. You have to lay it all out, nothing in the vagina for six weeks. The peri care instructions. Um, again, you want to wash your hands before you use the peri care bottle. You are going to use it squirting front to back for the first four to six weeks. Ice is your friend. Making a pad sickle using um, some unscented aloe vera and some witch hazel on those pads and then putting a spoonful of it and then uh, putting them in the freezer and having them ready to go. That's a great uh, tool to help heal and um, provide some comfort to the perineal area, signs and symptoms to report, and then nothing in that vagina. These are the one size fits all underwear that we utilize. We use very large pads. This is the peri bottle that I was talking about. Tux pads are an amazing um, tool. They have witch hazel in them. It takes down swelling. They can be used on the perineum. They can be used next to the hemorrhoids. They're a very good tool. And then here is a recipe and the instructions on how to make a pad sickle. Kegel exercises are, are an important um, tool to teach your mom to do. This is something that all women should be utilizing after they have had a baby. And this is helping to increase the strength in those pelvic floor muscles. Again, it does a lot of things for us. It helps our posture. It helps our um, bladder control. And um, it uh, helps as far as um, sexual performance as well. So pelvic floor muscles are very important. Teaching topics, of course, this is a Instagram photo. This is something that they um, set up. Obviously, he's not really doing that, but I thought it was a cute photo. Uh, teaching topics that we're going to be covering for that mom postpartum, obviously her first and foremost um, 
tool, teaching tool that she'd like to discuss is her pain and discomfort control. And then we want to talk about any immunizations, immunizations for mom. The one that we might be giving immediately postpartum would be her rubella vaccine. If she was, uh, if she had a titer of less than one to eight ratio, we're going to want to um, give her that rubella vaccine before she goes home. Also might want to give her her DTaP, her whooping cough, so that would cover her newborn cover her from exposing her newborn in the first few um, weeks and months. Uh, she might also, if it's flu season, want to have a flu vaccine before she goes home, which again is to protect her from bringing that um, virus home to her newborn. Nutrition, we want to talk about all those good things that I mentioned, lots of water, fresh fruits and vegetables, making sure that she's eating enough calories, activity and exercise, depending on whether she had a vaginal birth or a cesarean or if she had any extensive tearing. We'll be talking about um, what her activity is and we recommend after a cesarean not lifting anything heavier than their baby. And um, some physicians don't want them to drive for um, uh, two weeks uh, after a cesarean. If they were um, an athlete before they were pregnant, then they're going to be itching to get back out and do that sort of exercise again, but they do need to let their body heal before they get there. Lactation, this is a, a whole topic that I will be discussing in a few more slides um, and again when we talk about the newborn. And then safety, looking at things, uh, safety for both her and for the baby and making sure that we are covering um, uh, not leaving the baby on the couch, even though babies don't roll at this point. We don't. We want to make sure that they're in no, in in um, safe sleeping environments. We want to make sure that other children, dogs, are kept away from the newborn. Um, we don't recommend co-sleeping. There are um, lots of safety uh, uh, information that we need to be giving these moms. So our other discharge topics will include sexuality and contraception, letting them know that they can get pregnant even if they are breastfeeding. Again, what those community resources are, signs and symptoms for both mother and baby, and then basic baby care. Many people do not know how to change a diaper, do not know what to do if the baby is choking. So we give them good information about the bulb syringe, about uh, car seat use, about bathing, keeping them warm, feeding, normal, eyes and nose, that sort of thing and then most places now have some sort of follow-up whether it be telephone or an outpatient center or even follow-up in the home and we need to cover that topic as well that someone will be reaching out and letting them know where they can reach out if they need further assistance eventually the period is going to come back um, keep in mind the period comes back after ovulation has happened and the egg has not been fertilized so you may or may not know when you're ovulating this is why it is um, imperative that we are using some sort of uh, contraception early on so non-lactating women usually it's somewhere between seven and nine weeks after birth uh, any bleeding before that we're a little suspicious that maybe something else is going on so she should probably have that looked into and lactating women it really depends on the frequency and it can be anywhere from um, two to 18 months so our psychological assessment uh, we need to ask our mothers if there's any um, beliefs, practices, or customs that they're going to be following. We want to be open, respectful, non-judgmental. Sometimes you'll see things with uh, that have to do with hot and cold, so they won't drink cold foods, or they want to keep certain areas of their body um, hot. Some cultures have the rules of not um, really engaging it with the outside world for 30 to 45 days. There are some cultures that the husband and the wife don't touch each other while she's in that unclean state. So again, just asking the mom what it is that, what her customs and beliefs are, and then um, just being respectful and following those as best we can is, is what we as nurses will do. Bonding versus attachment, there is a close uh, bonding is the close emotional attraction to the newborn 
that the parents start to develop early within the first 30 to 60 minutes after birth. This is uni unidirectional, meaning it just goes one way. Attachment is what happens over the next few months. This is the strong affection between the infant and significant other. And that can be mother, father, sibling, caretaker, grandparent, whoever is in that child's life. And that really starts over the next six months. So bonding and attachment are two different things. We know that attachment happens better if bonding has also happened. So bonding is what we are um, supporting in the hospital. And this can become a little difficult if mom has had a traumatic delivery and really isn't in the mental or physical space to be bonding um, with her baby right away, or if the baby has to be separated and go to the NICU environment, that can affect bonding. So we are watching um, uh, and, and hoping to keep mom and baby and family together as much as possible so that bonding can happen. There are lots of psychological adaptations. Again, that attachment is going to be formed. Early and sustained contact is important. So this is why we know newborns need to stay in the rooms with their families if at all possible. So if they are healthy, they really need to be in the rooms with their parents. Nurses play a really crucial role in assisting with this process by, by praising the care that the uh, new family members the new parents are giving by showing them how to soothe babies by um, uh, just uh, imitating those actions so the baby's crying you walk in everyone seems a little frantic maybe you can um, soothe that baby a little bit and you're you're setting an example of how they might do that themselves looking at other things that might influence that attachment would be again the environmental circumstances are the is this family in a mental place to be able to start forming this attachment and the quality of nursing care if the family feels like this is just um, just a job to the nurses and that they're just there uh, to fulfill their 12 hours and that they aren't really important to the nurse then it can actually affect um, how they feel about the situation. The, the more precious and special we talk about this I event, it influences how they feel. The partner is going to really start that process of bonding once the baby has been born. They haven't had the opportunity to feel that baby moving inside them and haven't really, it hasn't really become real to them until they can be, be visually aware of this newborn. Being able to touch the baby, um, they will start to develop a, a, a strong attraction to this newborn. They'll start talking about how the newborn is perfect. They'll look for distinctive features sometimes there'll be extreme elation by the partner and definitely an increased sense of self-esteem on the part of the partner and you kind of see this happen from the time the baby's born over the next day or so as they are starting to develop that bond other factors that will affect attachment parents background like I said that staff indifference or lack of support the infant's temperament. We all know that babies and children and people have different temperaments and some babies are easier to care for than others. And so that definitely can affect um, the building of that attachment. If the babies had to be in an intensive care environment, if there's been separation immediately after birth, and then if there's policies that discourage exploring that infant, um, that can actually affect how that attachment is being formed. So there are four stages of becoming a mother. First, there's the commitment to the unborn baby and then preparing for delivery and motherhood. And then there's the acquaintance and bonding that happens with this baby, learning to care for this infant, trying to get back to their normal physical self in the first, in the two to four weeks. And now they're starting to move towards a new normal with this new child in their life. And then achievement of maternal identity somewhere happens um, around the fourth month for most people and this is when they're starting to feel like they have incorporated this baby into their life and they're they're exploring their role as a mother and this is really a a, a wondrous process that we get to see from the outside 
Other factors, uh, other factors that might affect maternal role is um, their confidence level. If they've had experience with babies before, of course, their age, their relationship with the father, being a new parent certainly puts a uh, uh, stress on their relationships, their socioeconomic status, if they have to go back to work right away, sometimes that can affect their process of bonding and forming attachments, what their birth experience was like, if they got the birth that they wanted, if they felt in control, if they felt valued, that definitely can affect how they um, form this maternal role, what their own personality traits are, how well they cope with stress, what their attitudes towards this child was in the beginning, what their health status is, and their relationship with their own mother, it, their own anxiety. So there are lots of things that will affect how this baby um, and mother uh, work through this process of learning each other. And then the infant, again, appearance, responsiveness, temperament, and how healthy and well the baby is doing in their transition. So what we look for in our emotional assessment is, are, are they interacting with other members of the family? Are they feeling, um, are, they, are they becoming withdrawn after the baby's born? What's their level of independence? Are they able to start to take um, action and control of some of the caregiving responsibilities of this newborn? What's their energy level? Are they making eye contact? posture, comfort level with the infant, sleep and rest patterns. We want to be alert for mood swings, irritability and crying episodes, but they're not uncommon. This, new, especially the first one, rocks your world. It changes everything. And so it's not uncommon, especially if they're exhausted and if they're in pain, it's not uncommon for them to feel um, overwhelmed and and wondering if they're going to be able to do this. It's our job to support them, to give them good feedback, to encourage them as much as possible. Motherhood is hard, having a baby is hard, and there are people and places that want to help you. So now when we're talking about lactation, there's a whole process that has to happen. This baby, once they go to the breast, it, it uses um, several signals. One of them is a physical signal, actually pulling this milk out of the breast. The milk ducts are back in this area and they come down these cannulas and the stimulation allows this these glands to say, okay, it's time for this milk to be squeezed out and come down here in um, response to the suckling of the infant. This also sends a message to the brain, to the hypothalamus, to release, release oxytocin that then works on this gland that allows the squeezing to happen. That's what we refer to when we say the letdown reflex. This takes several days for this process to become really refined. So in the beginning, there's very small amounts of milk. We call that colostrum. It's super high protein, high powerful stuff. It's not really there for nutrition. It's there to line the gut micro, uh, microbiome. It's there to um, give the baby lots of antibodies. It's there to get the process going. And then over the next few days, the more milk that is removed from the breast, the more milk is made and the baby gets better at it. The mom gets better at it and um, they start to kind of find their own rhythm. This position, we call this the ventral position, is the natural feeding position for a newborn. So it's moms don't necessarily love it because they can't really um, manipulate a lot about what's going on. But if you put a baby skin to skin with the mom right after delivery in this position and leave them alone, they actually will find the breast and self-attach themselves uh, if you give them enough time. Now, this has to be uninterrupted time. If we take them and weigh them, give them their newborn meds and generally just interrupt them, then it kind of... Um, uh, puts a wrench in that process, but they have a natural inclination and a natural drive to go to the breast and self-attach. And we should leave this uh, as uninterrupted as possible. And we say that golden hour is the most important time, but really this should, this position and this, um, 
uh, on interruption should happen until the first feeding. So if that happen, if that takes an hour, that takes three hours, baby will stay nice and warm skin to skin with mom. We can still do the assessments we need to do with mom's fundus, but the rest of everything else just needs to wait because this baby, the most important thing is getting to the breast and feeding early on. This sets up a lot of um, good practices for the future breastfeeding relationship. So here are some differences between breastfeeding and formula. So this means breast milk and formula. Um, it helps the mother and baby bond. It confers that passive immunity. It's protective against measles and other communicable diseases because they're, if the baby's been exposed to something, the baby will let the mom know that they've been exposed to something because the um, they will have that in their saliva and then the b mother's body will now make antibodies in uh, response to that. Better teeth and jaw development and then a reduction of um, neonatal sepsis, a reduction of all kinds of disease processes. And so we know that breast is best or that breastfeeding is best or that breast milk is best. For some people, it is very difficult to get breast and, uh, and mom and baby together at the breast. So there are other ways to get breast milk. There's donor breast milk that is available for these moms. There is, um, they if they have low supply, there are things like supplemental nursery systems that can still give the bond between the mom and the baby and the baby's getting the nutrition that they need. So this is what lactation consultants do is they work with the hardest of the hard issues in, in an effort to find what works for mom and baby. And that's really our goal is to find what works because doing it my way is not necessarily the best way and is not necessarily even possible for this mom and baby. So we have to help them find what's going to work for their family. Lots of benefits for, for mom and for baby. And I'll let you pause this video and take a look at this. There are benefits associated with reducing um, risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes with breastfeeding. Uh, it does assist with protecting against childhood obesity. And then there's this window of opportunity to really build that um, gut biome. And we know a lot of what we know about the gut biome, we've really learned in the past five to eight years or so. But early on, we build this immune system. And a good portion of, of this immune system is built by having human milk. Okay, and I will spend more time talking about the logistics of breastfeeding when we do our newborn chapter. So some of the disorders that we see in postpartum, um, hemorrhage, infection, thromboembolytic disease, having clot issues, and postpartum mood disorders. And these are the things we're going to talk about next. For our direct causes of maternal mortality, still the number one reason that women die after childbirth is because of hemorrhage. The next reason, hypertension. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and then we see sepsis. And then we see other indirect and, and direct causes. So this information, even though this is a little old, this um, actual graph, it still uh, rings true today. The number one reason women still die after childbirth is related to hemorrhage. So when we're talking about uterine sub-involution, we're talking about the incomplete involution of the uterus after birth. So one of the reasons that that uterus can't clamp down and can't go back to normal size is because there are retained placental fragments or the bladder's distended. If a woman is bleeding, the first thing we need to check is when was the last time her bladder was empty, Or if she has some sort of infection in the uterus, sometimes it doesn't work as well um, if there's an infection. Or if she has a tumor, some sort of um, uh, myoma growing in the uterus, that can keep it from clamping down and doing its job after delivery. So some of the complications that can happen from sub-involution, again, hemorrhage, peritonitis, salpenitis, that's infection of the tubes, or an abscess formation. And none of these things are desirable. So when we're looking at a postpartum hemorrhage, it's a potentially life-threatening complication of both vaginal and cesarean births. It's still the leading cause of maternal mortality, as I just said. 
For a vaginal birth, anything more than 500 mLs, or for a cesarean, anything more than 1,000 mLs, is considered a hemorrhage. Now, we do have stages of hemorrhage as well, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Any amount of bleeding that puts the mother in hemodynamic jeopardy, we're going to call that a hemorrhage. So for instance, she may have had some sort of bleeding disorder like abruption, placental abruption, or placenta previa where there was a lot of bleeding before the baby um, was born. And afterwards, she may not have enough to put her into one of these categories, but she's had enough to make her uh, bleeding to make her hemodynamically unstable. And so we would count that as, have, as being a hemorrhage. So some of the causes, again, the most common cause is that uterine atony, that uh, inability of that uterus to clamp down and, and seal off the wound of uh, the space that the placenta was. Um, sometimes lacerations of the genital tract, maybe up high that aren't uh, immediately visible can cause uterine or can cause hemorrhage. And the episiotomy can cause a hemorrhage, especially if you cut through an artery. There, if there's retained placental fragments, that uterus can't clamp down. Uterine inversion, which is when the uterus actually turns inside out. Most common reason for uterine inversion is tugging on that cord, trying to get the placenta to come if she's got some sort of coagulation disorder and then a hematoma a hematoma is actually a, a, a blood vessel that has been ruptured that's bleeding underneath the skin and sometimes you'll see that in the vulva sometimes it's in the vagina sometimes it's in the um, you can even have a hematoma in the peritoneum uh, after a cesarean sometimes you'll see it in the perineal area and we need to be on the lookout for that so this is an example of where the placenta was. This is the site and it is this uterus is filling up with blood because it's not clamping down, it's not contracting and stopping the bleeding from this area. So whenever we have a hemorrhage, we think about the five T's. What could be causing it? Is it thrombin? Is it a, is she have some sort of bleeding disorder? Is she preeclamptic? Has she had a fever in labor? Is she, did she have a placental abruption? Um, does she have von Willebrand's disease? And no one caught that. Tissue, is there retained placenta or what we call placenta accreta when the placenta has grown into the uterus and is not able to um, become dislodged? Number one cause of placenta accreta or procreta is um, re, uh, cesarean sections. Uh, they increase our chance of having abnormal placentation. Are there retained products of conception? What's the tone? Is the, was the uterus over distended? Was, did she have polyhydraminose? Was the baby very large? Was it a multiple pregnancy? Did we use uterine relaxants during the pregnancy? Did she have a history of a postpartum hemorrhage? Is there trauma? Did she have a cesarean section? Did she have an episiotomy? And then a couple of other, other things that can increase her chance of having a hemorrhage um, being of Asian ethnicity, having anemia before she delivered, induction. Induction increases our chance of postpartum hemorrhage because we've asked the body to contract and contract and contract and contract using medications usually. And now the uterus is tired. All those receptor sites are full and the uterus is tired. Um, is her BMI over 35? That increases her chance of having a hemorrhage. Did she have a prolonged labor? Is she older? Is she at advanced maternal age? All these um, factors put her at risk for postpartum hemorrhage. So the treatment is early recognition. And again, I've said this and I'll say it again. The first thing you're going to notice is that her, her pulse is going to rise and then you will start to see other um, signs. So we'll be watching that postpartum uh, fundal assessment every 15 minutes. If you if you notice large clots, if you notice soaking a pad, you need to start weighing that and adding it to the quantitative blood loss from the delivery to see if she may, meets the criteria now for hemorrhage. We want to focus on the underlying cause. Uterine massage, that is a nursing intervention that we can do immediately at the bedside to, to firm that uterus up and, and try to stop and control that bleeding. 
Removal of retained placental fragments, that would be up to the provider, either the midwife or the physician. Looking at antibiotics for infection, did we, did she, was she brewing an infection that we missed? Or if we're doing lots of removal of placental fragments, well, now we need to give her antibiotics so that we don't, um, that we can head off any um, infection. And then repairing those lacerations. So looking at that assessment, we want to know her risk factors. We ideally want to know this before we have a delivery. So we are looking at her her bleeding risk factors the minute we come into contact with this mother. The next thing we're going to be looking at her uterine tone. Where is it? Is it firm? Is it full? Is it uh, uh, how is the bleeding associated with it? it? Does she have clots forming? Is it a slow trickle unless you're doing a uterine massage? And then we're going to be looking at her vital signs. So we're, we'll start with fundal massage, doing a pad count. And um, if that those pads start to be soaked, we definitely want to do a quantitative blood loss. Administration of a uterotonic. We'll talk more about the meds in just a minute. Giving her some fluid, uh, some sort of a, a LR or sometimes normal saline in order to pump up that volume and help her keep her blood pressure up. Monitoring for signs and symptoms of shock. When you're going into shock, you're going to notice that her temperature is low. You're going to notice that her eyes are rolling back in her head. She's not answering you anymore. She now looks very pale, has um, uh, no color to her lips, to her face. Her blood pressure is going to start to decrease. If we see signs of shock, we need to be um, initiating our emergency response system so that we can help this woman by getting some fluid on board and um, possibly even some um, vasopressors to bring that blood pressure back up. And then these women are at very high risk for going into DIC, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So if, if this process happens, now we need to get our ICU team on board to help us manage uh, this this um, disease process. So early identification of risk factors, this is looking at reasons that you would be a low risk category for bleeding because all women having a baby are at some risk. So we categorize them by low, medium, or high. And you can see if you're in the low risk category, these are the um, uh, interventions that we would do. If you're in the medium risk category, these are the interventions that we would do. This is before she starts bleeding. This is uh, on admission. And then if you're in high risk, this is what we would do. So if somewhere during the care of this patient, we have one of these things happen, we now know that we probably need to move her up the scale of risk. And do the um, corresponding nursing interventions in order to be ready for that uh, risk. This is an example of the postpartum hemorrhage project that was one of the AWAN um, uh, evidence-based uh, practice projects. This is when we started the quantification of maternal blood loss and you can go through this slide and look um, all the things I've just been talking about are mentioned here, risk assessment, looking for those warning signs, having a massive transfusion protocol, making sure that we're using um, the correct products to give that transfusion therapy, managing with our medications, having a policy, making sure that we're doing team debriefing and simulation. If this is still the number one reason why we're losing women after childbirth, then we need to be practicing how to fix the problem. This is just a, a broken down um, to even a further degree to show you what an algorithm looks like. So if you're stage zero of hemorrhage, this is what your algorithm would be. If you're stage one, stage two, stage three, again, this comes from the A1 hemorrhage project and you're welcome to pause the slide and take a look at all the different um, uh, actions that need to happen. So when we talk about nursing interventions, this whole area here are nursing interventions that we can do because we have a standardized procedure or a policy um, and a massive and a, and a trans, uh, I'm sorry, a postpartum hemorrhage protocol that we can follow. We do still need a physician um, at the bedside, especially if you're here in that stage two. We want that physician at the bedside um, in order to be able to direct anything else that we might need. 
Here is another postpartum hemorrhage, um, just an infographic that looks at reasons within the first 24 hours of hemorrhage. These are primary reasons. And then after that first 24 hours, all the way up to 12 weeks. So we can have a secondary postpartum hemorrhage all the way up until 12 weeks after delivery. So here would be reasons and um, clinical findings that you would see. This is why we say, if she has profuse bleeding, if she has uterine tenderness, if she has foul smelling vaginal discharge or fever, we need to make sure that this um, patient gets some medical care so that we can diagnose that and give her the treatment that she needs. This is an example of how we learn um, what different amounts of blood loss actually look like. This is all fake blood. None of this is real. Um, this is looking at that large sanitary pad with 30 mLs on it. And here it is completely soaked. That's 100 mLs. If you've got um, uh, chucks and it's completely soaked, you can estimate that to be in about 250 mLs. If she's completely saturating the bed, that's about 1,000 mLs. And if it's saturating the bed and falling onto the floor, that's about 2,000. So this just gives us an idea of where we are. Now, of course, we would weigh this, but in the middle of a crisis, you're not gonna stop and weigh everything. So it just gives you a visualization of where you are at that moment. Here are some vital signs that you can expect to change as we start to lose that blood volume. So 750 mLs or up to 15% of the blood volume, this is where we would expect her vital signs to be. When she starts losing 750 to 1500, 15 to 30%, this is where we expect her vital signs to be. 1500 to 2000, 30 to 40%, this is where we expect her vital signs to be. So I want you to notice that you, until you've lost 30 to 40% of your blood volume, you are not gonna see a decrease in that blood pressure. So that is not your number one factor. You are going to see an increase in that heart rate and it's going to be your first sign. So pay attention to this slide, um, important information here. Some of the medications that we use, these are our uterotonics. I've talked about these extensively in the medication um, video that I've done. Pitocin, Methogen, Cytotec, Hemobate, and Transamic Acid. These are the five uterotonic medications that we have. And if your mom has hypertension, you need to cross Methogen off this list. It is not an option. You cannot use Methogen. If your mom has a history of asthma, you need to cross hemabate off your list. This is given very cautiously in asthmatic patients. So if your mom has had a, a long induction and has had lots of Pitocin, Pitocin's not gonna work as a uterotonic medication. So these are the only meds that we have and sometimes we um, start running into very few options depending on the disease process of the mom. So when you are looking at your stage one medications, this comes straight from ACOG and it will give you an idea of um, the normal dosages here. So again, avoid an asthma, uh, the hemabate or carboprost, and you also have a very high risk of diarrhea. It's important to know these side effects so you know what to expect. Um, you want to avoid methogen and hypertension and oxytocin you cannot use undiluted it must be in um, uh, diluted into an IV bag and we then piggyback it onto a main line here is our mat pack our massive hemorrhage protocol so when we talk about having a protocol this is what we would give a mom three units of packed red blood cells, two units of fresh frozen plasma, and one single donor platelet. And sometimes women will need one or two of these depending on how much blood loss she had. So we remember this is three, two, one. This is our massive hemorrhage protocol maternity pack. This is what we would use. This is called a um, rapid infuser. You have two ports coming here. It gets pr um, primed through special tubing. This also heats it up. This has a vacuum pack seal, so it can put in a liter of fluid in about three minutes, and it can put in blood. So these require really two nurses to operate, but if you have to 
very quickly, rapidly infuse someone who is bleeding and is continuing to bleed, this is would be something that we would utilize. This is a pressure bag that if you don't need to go to the rapid infuser, but you need it in there faster than you can do on a pump, this goes around your IV bag and then allows the um, you to use this bulb here to pump it up and it puts pressure against the bag and squeezes it. So essentially it's like you standing there squeezing it, but you don't have to stand there squeezing it. A couple of other tools that we might use. This is called a bimanual compression. This is uh, something that a provider might do in order to get that uterus to firm up. Because again, if you have uterine atony, she can be um, bleeding profusely and she can lose her entire blood volume in a very short amount of time. This is called a Bacri balloon. It requires a nurse and a physician um, to put this in. Basically, it's a um, it's like a giant Foley that we fill this up with sterile saline and it allows to have tamponade from the inside. Uh, this is the sort of thing that you would learn to use once you go into your training on your unit. Um, but just know that's called a Bacri balloon or an internal tamponade. And then last but not least, they might go in and do a surgical procedure to kind to put sutures in. This is called the V Lynch suture procedure. And again, a physician would do this and they would go in and actually it's tying off the main blood vessels to the uterus in an effort to stop her from massively hemorrhaging and or um, bleeding to death. And then last but not least, they may do um, an emergency cesarean section, which is to take the uterus out because uh, it's the source of the bleed. So now I'm gonna move on into the thromboembolytic conditions. Um, after delivery, moms are hypercoagulable we want them to be that way because we want them to be able to clot and not bleed, but this means that they have a chance of having clots in other areas. So if there's inflammation to a blood to the blood vessel lining, if they're hypercoagulable, if they've had injury to those blood vessels, they can actually have a clot somewhere else, for instance, in the back of the leg. So the three most common types are superficial, usually confined to the saphenous vein of the leg, a deep vein thrombosis, which can move into um, a pulmonary embolus, and then venous stasis. And one of the ways that we combat these is by making sure that they're wearing either a TED hose or these anti-embolytic stockings while they're on bed rest. This will keep them, hopefully, from forming a clot. They should also be flexing that foot and, and um, moving their legs around when they're in bed. If they are already at high risk, they may be on some sort of anticoagulant therapy. Not so great to be on that when you're delivering a baby because then you have a higher chance of hemorrhage. But if they already have a clot or at risk for clots, you may see something to this effect. But the most important thing is our nursing intervention here of keeping them from forming those clots. And then amniotic fluid embolus, this is likely caused, we don't exactly know everything about amniotic fluid embolus, sometimes called AFI, but most likely it's caused by a small amount of amniotic fluid and or fetal tissue, hair, um, cells, moving from the fetal area, from the uterus, into the mother's vascular system. And when it does that, it causes an inflammatory and anaphylaxis type response that causes immediate cardiopulmonary uh, dysfunction, if not complete collapse. So the risk factors for amniotic fluid em embolus are advanced maternal age, having more than one baby, placenta previa or abruption, eclampsia, Oxytocin administration is a risk to amniotic fluid embolus, diabetes, cesarean birth, forceps assisted birth, uterine rupture, cervical laceration, and meconium stained fluid. So all of these are risk factors. This is not a very common occurrence, thank goodness. Um, but unfortunately we have seen a rise in the last few years. We are, there's a lot of research going on about protocols um, to treat this rapid collapse. If this happens as the baby is still on the inside and mom is in um, uh, cardiopulmonary collapse and we are doing CPR, we have 
three to four minutes to um, get this baby out. So we typically will do what's called an intrapartum cesarean section or a perimortem um, cesarean section. And that's where they do an emergency cesarean in the room in an effort to take the stress off of the mom's cardiovascular system as well as um, allow the baby to survive. Uh, so again, not a very common situation, thank goodness, um, but we have seen a rise in um, the last 10 years or so. Postpartum infections. So anytime we see a temperature of 100.4 or more, especially after the first 24 hours, we want to investigate. We assume it's an infection in the uterus or an infection in the blood. And um, we need to treat that uh, aggressively. We can't wait in order for her to become sicker. Um, we need to treat right away. So it could be a wound infection, it could be a urinary tract infection, or it could be mastitis, which is um, inflammation of the breast tissue. So to avoid those infections, some of the nursing interventions that we do is hand washing, making sure that we're doing good hand hygiene before touching a patient, wearing gloves to protect her from us, as well as to protect us from any um, bacteria and or um, things that she might uh, be able to spread back to us. Screening of visitors, making sure that people are not sick vaccines are a way of protecting people that we're caring for so us having a flu vaccine keeps us from um, spreading hopefully that infection to other people we can administer antibiotics make sure that we're doing good wound care teaching her about good perineal hygiene and telling her signs and symptoms to report Engorgement is the um, natural process that happens after delivery, but it's based on a lot of the fluid that we've pumped in to these women. So it's breast tissue that increases after the baby has been born and it increases in response to the blood and lymph supply. It's a precursor to lactation. It is relieved by frequent emptying of the breast, warm showers and compresses, um, and a tight supportive bra. Ice up on top of the bra works really well. Cabbage is another really great tool that we can use um, to re relieve some engorgement. Um, this is just showing you that bags of frozen peas or corn actually work as a really good ice pack and you can just throw them right back into the freezer. So treating that engorgement usually happens about the third or fourth day after delivery is really essential information for these moms um, because it's going to happen once they go home and the problem is you can see when you compare this normal breast to this engorged breast is this baby is going to be able to latch on to this area but is not going to be able to latch on here and then you're going to have feeding difficulties and nipple damage and it's just a, um, a road that we don't want to go down Mastitis is actually infection within the breast tissue. You do not have to stop breastfeeding with mastitis because it's not the milk that's infected, it's the tissue. Women feel um, usually flu-like symptoms, they're feverish, they have a hard, uh, reddened, sore lump in that area, and we do want to get um, antibiotics on board to help this mom treat this infection as soon as possible. And teaching about postpartum blues. So as I mentioned before, there is some normal transient emotional disturbances after that baby is born. You'll see things like anxiety, irritability, insomnia, crying, loss of appetite, sadness. These usually happen around the second to third, fourth day after childbirth and resolve by day 10. If they don't resolve, or if they become progressively worse, or they don't happen for several weeks, then we start to worry that maybe we've moved into the postpartum depression and or psychosis realm. And these will require a professional referral. We usually tell women go back and talk to their OBGYNs or their midwives, and they will um, be able to point them into the right direction to start getting this treated. Signs of normal, baby blues are listed on this slide typically resolves within two weeks by day 10 or so and is usually self-limiting signs of postpartum depression are symptoms that are lasting six weeks and getting worse you might see um, 
some of those same symptoms, but they're just continuing on and uh, they're not getting better. And then psychosis is when they start having um, thoughts possibly of harming themselves or the baby. And this is a obvious immediate cry for help and we need to not leave them alone and get them um, to the nearest facility that can help them deal with this. One of the tools that we use in the hospital is called an Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. And this is a self-scoring tool that we will give all moms in the hospital. If each po its hospital is going to have a different policy. If you um, typically, if you score higher than, um, here's our scoring system. Minor depression is somewhere in the eight to nine range. Major depression is eight and a half to 15. And if number 10 is anything other than never, if the answer to number 10 is anything other than never, we need to um, contact social services. So this is a way of making sure um, we have kind of a starting point when moms leave the hospital in order uh, to know where they are or if we need to intervene before they leave the hospital. I hope that you found this video useful. If you have any questions, um, you know where to reach me.